Um, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you all for having me speak to you all here virtually. I wish I could have been there in person, but um, I had other travels planned and I just wasn't able to make it work. So I hope to visit Seoul someday. And um, I'm just very grateful for the opportunity to um, present virtually. So thank you to the organizing committee for adapting um, and working with me so that I could chat with you all. Um, I will be speaking about wildlife as sentinels for monitoring climate change impacts on health and disease emergence. And um, kind of a quick overview or background about who I am, because I think it helps to provide some context um, for why I'm thinking about things this way. Um, so I'm formally trained as a veterinarian. And I did my doctor of veterinary medicine and my master's of public health. And then after that, I did a two year residency specializing in infectious disease microbiology and clinical diagnostics and followed that with a PhD um, in virology studying emerging viruses in bats and other wildlife with a focus on uh, arboviruses. And so a lot of my work has been focused on vector-borne disease and wildlife. Those are kind of the two themes that I um, think about a lot. But more recently, I've kind of been merging those two um, in some studies examining the impacts of climate change on wildlife health and um, disease transmission between wildlife and humans and other um, other organisms in the uh, their shared ecosystem. So um, that's kind of my background. Uh, and right now I'm at Colorado State University. I'm a research scientist and I spend most of my time working with colleagues um, who are in Verena. And Verena is the Viral Emergence Research Initiative. Um, it's now an NSF funded institute, but we are a group of largely early career researchers and we focus on um, asking questions about disease emergence, cross-species transmission, and um, I'm the research lead for biology integration. And so I kind of work between our bat team and our mosquito team and end up helping translate a lot of different things and kind of, I'm kind of the interdisciplinary go-to person. So um, without further ado, we will get into it. So, um, as I just mentioned, I'm currently at CSU and I spend most of my time thinking about vector borne pathogens, cross species transmission, and more recently, climate change impacts on wildlife health. And so, um, the speakers that have been presenting today, this lineup is so wonderful. And I feel like um, Dr. Moran really kind of set me up nicely for what I'm going to be talking about. It's all very synergistic. But when we think about climate change impacts on infectious disease transmission, whether we're thinking about humans or domestic animals like livestock or wildlife, the kind of big drivers, if we were to kind of grossly clump them into some groups, the drivers of this increased transmission, um, I would say the big things are novel interspecies interactions. And so climate change can cause this by causing range shifts, altered migratory patterns, and then for humans, globalization. So just people and organisms moving around to maybe avoid warmer climates. Um, extreme climate events often cause dispersal or sometimes consolidation um, and crowding, just depending on what has happened. And then one of the big things that we often think about with climate change and infectious disease um, are vector-borne diseases. And so um, ecological changes that are resulting in, um, you know, either more abundant um, vector species or perhaps even changes in vector ecology. So um, range extension from mosquito species, maybe mosquitoes expanding or, or switching host preference and becoming more flexible. So there are all these different things that are happening. And then one thing that I spend a lot of time thinking about as a vet and as someone who has done some work looking at um, kind of immune, immunology and virology is I think a lot about how different stressors impact our immune status and how there's so much we don't understand about that. And so 
Um, thinking about in humans, we know that if you're stressed, you are probably going to be more susceptible to, um, you know, respiratory coronavirus or seasonal cold. But um, expanding that and kind of extrapolating that to other species can be really difficult. And so that's what I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, this is a schematic that I made for a talk a couple of months ago, and um, I shared it. And then I kind of was looking at it and realized that I had made a bit of a faux pas. So I'll walk you through it and then I will criticize myself. So um, this is a schematic of some different zoonotic vector-borne pathogens specific to or kind of focusing here on North America. And so when we think about um, how complicated vector-borne pathogens are, let's get a pen here, um, how complicated they are to kind of define the ecology of, we, you know, we've got ticks, we've got mosquitoes, several different types of mosquitoes, several types of ticks. There are several other arthropods that um, transmit zoonotic infectious agents um, that are not pictured here, but this is really just to kind of highlight the diversity of different vector-borne pathogens, and, and this is really kind of largely focused on viruses here, and so it just highlights how much is going on. We've got flavy viruses going between um, American robins and other passerine birds and mosquitoes, and then we've also got some arboviruses that are transmitted, you know, between or have um, cervids as an amplification host. And so this, all this to say, in this image, humans are centered, but what I realized I had done is I had put the humans in the center when really I am trying to think about think about all of this through a less anthropocentric lens, anthropocentric lens. So really humans are just a single node in this really complex um, web of interactions. And so um, I, I just like to use this and kind of make an example of myself. I think so often we look at disease ecology, ecosystem health, through a fairly anthropocentric lens. And then when we do that, what are we missing? So um, in addition to humans being a single node in this complex network, susceptible wildlife species are each a node. Um, each of the arthropods is a node. And so when we just think about all of these interspecies interactions and we kind of think less about humans as the, you know, the forefront or the pinnacle of this, um, we can we can really start to think differently about how to evaluate how to evaluate the health of the ecosystem by looking at the health of some of the wildlife species. And so one thing that I found in a few papers, um, which I will, one of which I'll briefly talk about, is that um, sampling bias is a huge problem when we are looking at wildlife species, when we are trying to determine which pathogens are circulating in wildlife. And so often when there are studies, like one that I'll share here shortly, studies that are looking at multiple wildlife species, you end up seeing this overrepresentation of large charismatic megafauna. Um, wolves might be sampled and talked about and thought about more often than a shrew or a vole. Um, and so that's another thing that I think is one of my like big, you know, one of my soapboxes, I guess, or something that I think of a lot is um, how just by focusing too much on humans and other large charismatic megafauna and not focusing as much on some of these smaller mammals, which rodents and bats, we know are very good at amplifying some of these pathogens. And we really don't understand the different ways in which they may be susceptible to land use change and climate change. You know, what are we missing? So um, climate change and animal health, this I think is kind of a rapidly expanding area. Most of the work that I have found to be really valuable and informative, um, or I guess just a, a majority of the work in general, has been performed in livestock species when we're looking at the direct impact of climate change on animal health. So um, there are numerous really, really amazing papers looking at um, thermal stress and dehydration effects in broiler chickens and dairy cows is another big one. Um, and so, the nice thing with having kind of these systems to look at and then start to maybe think, OK, could we see some of this happening in wildlife is with these animals, we've got really nice baseline reference intervals available. 
um, which we do for humans and many domestic animals. And so it facilitates longitudinal data collection because you've got this kind of baseline that you can compare to. And then also when we're looking at agricultural systems, they, you know, these are very tightly monitored systems. Many of them are closed or specific pathogen free. And so there isn't a lot of movement in and out of the population. Um, and so that, you know, these are things that make it, and they may be kind of genetically um, bottlenecked in a way if they're, you know, very specifically bred. And so there are all of these limitations in kind of extrapolating some of the studies of heat stress and other climate impacts, um, extrapolating that from agricultural animals to wildlife. But I would say just in general, impacts on wildlife health are difficult to define because wildlife health is difficult to define. So a um, couple of things that I'll go through here. Why is wildlife health important? What are some of the different ways that climate change impacts wildlife health? And then how can we leverage uh, collecting and sharing wildlife health data and kind of, you know, make the some, um, I'm sorry, make the, the data are more powerful than the sum of their parts, I guess. And so how can we, um, you know, facilitate some of the synthesis and harmonization of data streams and so we can start to understand some of these changes on a larger scale. So we've already spoken about, you know, wildlife health is often when we think of wildlife health, I think we think of wildlife disease and pathogen surveillance. Um, wildlife as reservoirs for zoonotic pathogens we've discussed. Wildlife, I mean, they're important, just intrinsically important because they provide ecosystem services, but also many studies, looking back to the, the wonderful talk we just heard, um, many studies have demonstrated that loss of biodiversity is detrimental to, um, to the health of the ecosystem, to the health of the populations living in that ecosystem. And so in addition to the ecosystem services that wildlife provide, um, I would say it's important to, to um, you know, conserve those species because it's important to conserve those species, but they do provide a lot of great ecosystem services. So then thinking about wildlife as sentinels, um, I, I think, you know, usually when we think of wildlife sentinels, I usually think of pathogen circulation. So um, some of our very first viral detections, for instance, Zika virus, was isolated from a non-human primate that was being held in a canopy in 1947 in Uganda. That's how we found Zika virus. And so a lot of the kind of earlier virus detection, virus isolation stories, those came from sentinel animals, whether they were chickens or primates. But I think that we can also look at wildlife as sentinels for environmental perturbation. So land use change, how are stressed animals, um, you know, how is this impacting them? And then what might that be saying about the larger ecosystem as a whole and then climate change as well? So um, what is wildlife health? This could be probably like an all day thing on its own, but um, I really like how the World Health Organization has included in their definition of human health, that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So I think that we often kind of have this idea of wildlife health is looking at, you know, wildlife mortality, wildlife die-offs, and, you know, um, influenza and different bird species. We often think about it through this lens of kind of pathogens and um, pathology associated with different infectious zoonotic agents. And so um, I really like this last kind of clause here. And then there are some really, if you're interested in this stuff, there's some really wonderful initiatives that are out there, um, really exciting to see. So WOE, used to be OIE, um, has this really great wildlife health framework that I was spending a little time looking through. So there's it's definitely gives me hope how much um, how much we're kind of starting to think about wildlife health in a larger kind of more formalized framework. So um, this is the first this is my first first author paper back when I was in veterinary school and um, my one of my earliest supervisors, Colleen Duncan, um, is a veterinary pathologist and we worked on this study with some colleagues up in um, Fairbanks, Alaska.
where we reviewed the literature to describe what we knew about infectious agents in polar bears. And um, so polar bears as a species are obviously, they're threatened by a number of different things. Um, land use change, climate change are big ones. And we've realized that really there, there's not much that we know about um, which infectious agents may pose the biggest threat to them, if any. And so we systematically reviewed the literature and found several things, but um, this was another, this was kind of my earliest example of where I really learned that we don't know that much about wildlife. Most of what we do know about wildlife health is taken from captive or um, kind of habituated animals. And so for instance, we know that polar bears can get West Nile virus because a polar bear in a zoo in Mexico was presumably bitten by a mosquito infected with West Nile, developed neurologic disease and died. Now, I think that's very interesting, especially from a um, arbovirology standpoint, but when we have a lot of kind of really interesting and odd case reports like that, how can we, how do those data inform or do those, those papers inform kind of the larger context for what threats that species may be facing in, in the real world. And so um, what we ended up finding here is there really isn't much literature supporting the, the idea that there are infectious agents directly threatening polar bear populations. It really seems that climate change and land use change are the biggest threats. However, we really don't know what happens when there are synergistic stressors and multiple stressors occurring at once. How do wildlife face those? I mean, we're we don't really understand how human populations face, um, you know, multiple synergistic stressors when you think about different comorbidities and, um, and so it's, yeah, it's very complicated, but um, this is just a little schematic I made to think about kind of the, the process of stress on wildlife and how that may lead to cross species transmission. So um, as we spoke about, um, I think a few minutes ago here, there are, multiple stressors that wildlife face. And so we have abiotic and biotic factors, biotic factors being nutritional stress, maybe color infection, um, some other um, you know, reproductive stress, things like this. All of these stressors have the capacity to cause immunosuppression. And so when we see wildlife species that are immunosuppressed, we see decreased innate immune responses. And this really, this can be said for most organisms. And so just kind of underlining the uh, notion of translational comparative medicine. While there are a lot of differences between species, we really are more alike than I think uh, I usually anticipate. I'm always like shocked at the similarities. So stressors in wildlife or humans may cause immunosuppression, which may look like decreased innate immunity. So decreased ability to fight off a pathogen, a novel pathogen that um, you are not um, previously exposed to or vaccinated against, you end up um, being unable to seroconvert or maybe mount a um, less robust neutralizing antibody response. You're more susceptible to co-infection and other comorbidities. And then ultimately at the population level, this can lead to a lower herd immunity, lower seroprevalence, fewer individuals who have neutralizing antibodies. And so it can kind of result in this perpetual um, or I guess what one might think of as like a reservoir population. Now that term can be very difficult to define, but when we think about um, wildlife that are kind of persistently infected or we persistently see um, these pathogens in, I think, you know, a lot of it could be due to, you know, is that population experiencing stress? And that's why we're finding a high prevalence. Um, and then in addition to immune perturbations, we see behavioral changes that can lead to increased um, cross-species transmission or just new interactions. So increased trauma. A lot of animals that are hit by cars, I would love to just screen them for different infectious pathogens. Um, I think a lot of the time we see a bird of prey hit by a car and we don't think, oh, we should test that bird for West Nile virus. Um, but a few studies that have done just that have found some really interesting patterns. And so um, behavioral changes can be 
numerous and very diverse. You can see decreased foraging, which then leads to further nutritional stress, decreased grooming, reproductive failure. Um, and then, as I mentioned, novel or changed interactions between individuals of the same species or between, say, humans um, and between them and humans. And so when we think about how many different stressors they're exposed to and the fact that we really often don't understand how compounding or synergistic stressors may operate, um, it really it, it kind of underscores um, how much work we have left to do in understanding how wildlife health um, and the kind of drivers or the, the impacts of climate change may directly or indirectly impact wildlife's um, whoops, ability to ability to withstand infection. And so when we think about, okay, well, what can we do? I, it's, it's hard to approach this because there are so many different things, but I think a lot of it comes down to sharing data, sharing protocols, more interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think that that can be difficult to operationalize. But I think, again, with just opening up lines of communication and having, um, you know, formal opportunities where we can all chat and talk about some different ideas or different potential kind of, you know, sample sharing, things like that. I mean, I think that's the best way to start. So better baselines when we think about um, species specific reference intervals. I mean, this is so complicated, but I think we need to be mindful of comparing what we find in captive zoo animals or to some of these free ranging populations. Now, there are a few studies where researchers have this longitudinally monitored wild population. Um, very few systems um, kind of are able to successfully operate like that for multiple years because it's, ex it's expensive and there are many, many barriers. But um, being able to set up more studies like this may be informed initially by data from captive animals is a good start. Um, as I said, data sharing, interdisciplinary collaboration, I, it sounds, it can sound a bit old hat or kind of cliche sometimes, but it's just, that is so important. And then sampling optimization. So this is where I think it's really important to share protocols with one another and open up the lines of communication to figure out how to leverage existing sampling frameworks, leverage existing study sites, build new collaborations, figure out how we can get more information or get the most information possible out of a sample from an animal, particularly one that has been euthanized. So I think trying to optimize non-lethal or minimally invasive techniques is another thing that will allow us to maximize the information we do get from a single sample. Now, um, let's see, I'm going to, I'm running out of time. So quickly, I will discuss this paper um, that I got to work on with Verena. And so this was a systematic review of the literature where we assessed prior to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, what did we know about um, spillback or human to wildlife, human to animal pathogen transmission? So um, when we started to see um, transmission from humans to mink, this is a lot of people started talking. And then the number of species that we saw SARS-CoV-2 infect increased just so, so substantially. I still look back on it and I'm like, wow, that was wild. Nobody saw that coming. Well, few people saw that coming. So this is a figure that I like to, um, I use for a lot of different things, but this is one of our figures from this paper. And so it shows how when you have this initial spillover event and then you have the pathogen establish itself in humans, there is this question about whether the pathogen can spill back from humans into wildlife. Um, and, and then if it does, there are kind of two outcomes. You can have a new dead end host where that animal isn't susceptible, or, um, experiences morbidity, mortality, and isn't able to kind of function um, with that infection underway, and therefore it doesn't really serve as a good maintenance reservoir. Now, the alternative here is that we do see a secondary uh, wildlife maintenance reservoir develop. So this would be kind of like what we've seen with some different cervid populations in SARS-CoV-2 um, in North America, particularly. So then the concern here is, okay, what if there is a secondary spillover or what if you see transmission of this kind of new, this, this evolved version of this virus, then spill, or I'm sorry, 
um, reinfect humans. And so this is kind of a lot of what this, this paper looked at. And um, we ended up, we, we kind of thought about some of these processes and how complicated they are. And well, you can read the paper if you want to look at the specifics, but I will just say spoiler alert, kind of the, the big overarching theme was huge sampling bias and captive animals sampling bias in big charismatic megafauna. And there really isn't that much evidence for new secondary maintenance reservoirs existing except for one or two case reports of like a skunk with flu. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, but then, you know, after we published this paper, we saw everything happen with the white tailed deer. And so I think, you know, nature likes to keep us on our toes, but I think developing these frameworks can be helpful. And I think also looking at, again, humans are this node, this figure is, I guess, a bit anthropocentric, but at least being able to recognize and acknowledge that, you know, there are all of these other species that are, exist over here and are susceptible um, or, or not to whatever pathogens in question. Um, I'm going to skip past this. There's another paper that um, I'll just really briefly talk about where we studied the prevalence of Bartonella in Tropus bats and their ectoparasites, bat flies. I, I love ectoparasites. If you do too, please email me. Um, but we, we examined the prevalence and some of the phylogenetic diversity in these, in these um, strains that we detected, but then um, we were also able to examine seasonality and some different life history factors and kind of start to develop a sense of whether or not some of these populations we were sampling may be stressed out, and that's why we're seeing a higher prevalence in them. And so it's kind of just an example of how we can operationalize some of this using longitudinal monitoring to kind of develop some wildlife health proxies. Um, there are several limitations. I think I've discussed most of these expensive, time intensive, um, cold chain maintenance can be very difficult. And then long term funding is difficult to secure. And so to get around this and just kind of in the name of open data, um, Verena just launched um, two weeks ago our Pharos, which is our pathogen harmonized surveillance database. And so this is an open platform. It's free to use. Anyone can use it. You can submit your data. You can look at other public data. And the idea is to share wildlife surveillance data sets so that we can, again, the data being more than the sum of its parts, start to really develop some predictive models and kind of monitor wildlife pathogens like the weather. And so, um, yeah, that is the, it's, ferris.viralemergence.org and um, so many people to thank. And of course, I don't have time to thank all of them. I'm sorry. Um, but if you'd like to chat about any of this, please get in touch. Um, I really like talking to other researchers with similar or very different interests. So thank, thank you. And I'm sorry that I ran right up till the last moment. <clears throat> no, no worries. Thank you so much, Anna. That's really very good. Let's give her a round of applause. And I was just, again, stressing the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature of the subject we are discussing, but looking at it from the perspective of wildlife, uh, uh, exhaustion about um, looking at data in a longitudinal way and having this new asset she's just described, I think is a positive thing. Uh, nonetheless, the fact that climate and environmental stressors can impact on uh, transmission of diseases, uh, reservoir host uh, behavior, as well as impact on novel transmission of infectious agents, I think uh, very important points that Anna raised. Um, we haven't got a lot of time for question, but if there's just one burning one, I'll take, otherwise we'll go to the last. Yeah, Dimitri. Yeah, hello, Anna. Thank you very much for your participation to the meeting, uh, even online. It was very nice to, to see you. Um, yeah, I really wonder because um, SARS, of course, outbreak illustrates very well the fact that SARS uh, was able to infect wildlife in captive animals in zoos. There are many examples in the world. Um, and also of the feedback to now a new animal reservoir in forests like deers and everything that will be a big stress for the second outbreak of SARS. Um, so 
how do you think this event in the past already happened in other diseases? Is there any, any other examples already um, that come to your mind and that people m might check more carefully? Because as a sentinel, of course, wild type is very important, but it might be very difficult to, to follow all the diseases. So is there any focus scientists should, fo should put on some disease? Thank you for that question, Dimitri. It's great to see you too. Um, that is a great question. So thinking about prioritizing different pathogens, um, there are a number of different ways to do this. Now, I'm not a modeler. I'm not like a data scientist by training. Um, but in Verena, there are several people who um, develop some pretty um, interesting models. And I do some of the bioinformatics and genomics work on these models to kind of try to develop genomic predictor tools. Um, but so we, there are some things underway and some things currently already developed where, you know, you're looking at different kind of nucleotide compositions within a virus and saying, okay, that is more likely to infect humans. And so in addition to, you can kind of marry some of these um, computational tools with in vivo and in vitro studies where then maybe you say, okay, our genomic computational model predicted this, let's take this to the lab and see if that holds up and it actually does infect this species. But then I think getting back to um, the importance of studying free-ranging populations, looking at, you know, what has the past taught us? What can we learn from history in terms of which species may be susceptible to a particular pathogen? Um, and then developing baselines. So I, I think even just screening sera from, you know, 100 animals in a population for exposure to, you know, different diseases or testing them for a particular pathogen. Um, even if you don't find anything um, that is, you know, worth writing a nature paper over, negative data are important data. And when we, when we start to think about how to detect changes in, in prevalence, I think when we don't have the baselines, even if the baseline was negative data, um, we're missing so much. Now, again, those are the studies that can be really difficult to get funded. And so I think leveraging existing frameworks. So do you want to, I hate to use North America as the example, but one example is, okay, we want to see what's happening in white-tailed deer. Well, chronic wasting disease, the prion disease, is routinely tested in hunter-killed deer. So now let's take those brains that are being routinely screened for the presence of chronic wasting disease. Let's subject that brain to um, testing for SARS-CoV-2 and Jamestown Canyon virus and some other arboviruses that we know infect the brain. Or let's take the sera and let's just screen it for a while developing biorepositories and archiving samples. Another thing that is expensive to do, but I think if we can invest in that, developing kind of these long-term historical repositories, that's when, you know, we find a new pathogen, we can say, hey, let's look back and see if it was circulating in this population 10 years ago. When we don't save samples, we can't do that. So um, a lot of it comes down to funding and being able to support some of these initiatives, but, um, yeah. Okay. Sorry, that was a really long yeah. answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will move on to the next uh, uh, speaker now, which is um, the last one for this session. Uh, another big round of applause for Anna. Thanks. <laughs> 